Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artists Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture featuring London-based artist Jeremy Deller. Each academic year, SAC's Visiting Artists Program hosts public presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Throughout its history, the program has served as a critical resource and inspiration for our community. We are honored to welcome Jeremy Deller back to SCAC. He was actually a visiting artist here in 2002. And I would like to thank him for taking the time to return to Chicago and the school to share his work with our community. I would also like to thank the Illinois Arts Council Agency for their support of tonight's program. At the end of Jeremy's talk, we'll have about 10 minutes or so to take a few questions from the audience. Our staff will circulate microphones for your use. Please ask if you have a question. Please raise your hand. and. Um, to stand and say your name and to keep your question concise. And to introduce Jeremy Deller this evening, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Oliver San, SAAC's Associate Professor in the Department of Photography. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, got a bit of a cold. <clears throat> It's an honor and my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Deller here today. Um, Jeremy clearly has changed the way we think about art and what art can be. My personal encounter with his work was in 2001 watching Mike Figge's documentary film on Deller's art project, The Battle of Orgrieve, in which he reenacted the violent battle between miners and police during the 1984 miner strike. Della had somehow, and I still I will ask him if nobody does, definitely later, uh, he managed to convince almost 1,000 people, including 280 local residents and a number of people, police and picketeers, from the original encounter to reenact this mass event. I couldn't believe what I saw, the, the, the reenacting of a mass protest and the subsequent escalation of it as a piece of art. So, but Della convinces that a brass band playing acid house tunes can be art as much as a t-shirt with the description of how to quit your Facebook account or posters scattered around London saying, strong and stable my ass," extending Theresa May's Brexit slogan by two words. Della redefined what art can be by having Iggy Pop posing nude for a live drawing class or shooting a film on Depeche Mode fans worldwide, making a sticker saying, I love you, joyriding, or producing a 3D film on bats, or organizing a church basement jumble sale, and uh, that's the equivalent, the, Amer the American equivalent for this is a garage sale, a rummage sale I learned today, actually. And building in an inflatable Stonehenge as a bouncy castle. So for Della, literally all that is solid seems to melt into air, to quote Marshall Berman, who Della bought his title for a project from, and Berman obviously bought from Marx. Jeremy Della describes what he learned from Andy Warhol, uh, who he collaborated with in 1986 uh, as a 20-year-old as follows. You could make art out of whatever you were interested in. You could run a magazine, make film, TV, print, painting, music production. Music in particular seems a core subject and area for his performative and ephemeral projects, projects often without any great production value, Della rejecting to produce commodified objects of desire for a market rather creating interventions, enactments, and reenactments, rather working with people than with things. And subsequently, Della's credo is, art isn't about what you make, but what you make happen, which I find rather impressive. Although Della is quoted insisting that he's not a political artist, I insinuate he simply knows that there is no way not to be political today. Della has exhibited at the Sculpture Museum uh, in Münster. He, rep he represented Britain at the 55 Venice Biennial. He showed his work at Hayward Gallery in London, Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, New Museum New York, Hammer Museum Los Angeles, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Kunstverein Munich, and Barbican Art Gallery. Next to more, 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 and more. And Della won the Turner Prize in 2004 for his work, Memory Bucket. His recent curatorial projects include Iggy Pop Life Class in the Brooklyn Museum, and Love is Enough, William Morris and Andy Warhol Modern Art Oxford. All that solid melts into air is uh, at Manchester Art Gallery. Please help me welcome Jeremy Della.
Thank you, Oliver. I feel like I... I don't even, almost don't need to do the talk now after that introduction, but um, it's very comprehensive. I'm going to talk about uh, probably maybe six projects, uh, but I always begin talks just really showing the, th the beginning of what of my career, if you can call it that. Um, I didn't go to art college. I didn't do art at high school even, uh, only for like six months. And so I left, uh, left school, I went to university and studied art history, Baroque painting mainly. And uh, after that, I just didn't really know what to do with myself for quite a long time. I worked uh, in a gallery. I just was uh, unemployed for a long time. This was in the sort of late 80s, early 90s when being unemployed was actually quite common so uh, I did that and then gradually I sort of became confident and started doing things and I wasn't really sure what it was but it's uh, things just accrued almost this is all this in a way I always show this image is the first show I, I made that I was I can be happy with I mean I made work before this but I'd, you wouldn't want to see it frankly so this is a, a show I did when my parents went on holiday I, I lived at home till I was 30 and uh, I took over the whole house and uh, put my work up and took their, the work they'd bought or, th or um, did installations throughout the house. And this is my bedroom at the time. And it was a series of paintings I made about the life of Keith Moon. This is a self-explanatory room. Um, on the walls are, it's graffiti from the men's toilets at the British Library. Um, and it's, really a, it's a mixture of sort of sexual frustration and sort of intellectual the heights of intellect as well. So it's actually very funny, but unrepeatable. Um, and, and also it's, in, it's sort of academics having arguments with each other in the toilets, more or less. So it's just this book, and that went in, the, in my parents' toilet. My parents didn't know about this show until about 10 years later when this, they saw this photograph in a book. And my mother was horrified that I'd left the toilet seat up. That's the only thing she was really concerned about, which I felt was actually a good thing. But um, in a way, my career proper starts in sort of 1996 when I had an idea for a, a brass band, which is a very traditional form of music making in Britain to play acid house music, which had just recently been like the major electronic dance music. It had been a youth cult, effectively, what we would call youth cult in terms of um, its popularity. And in a way, it was for me, I was trying to work out how if you could tell the story of British history through music. If actually, as I saw, popular culture and especially popular music can't be separated from history, especially social history. And this was an attempt to bring the sort of 20th and 19th century together. And maybe the 21st century as well, if you think about electronic music, was really a prediction of the 21st century. So I made this mind map which, um try to connect industrial culture and music of brass bands with acid house music, um, which obviously is a music that originates in America, in Detroit, but also in Chicago. And uh, as you can see, I, go, I love using these things. There, there we go. And um, it, of course, it has a com comedic feel to it because of course, these, in a way, these music movements have nothing in common. So there's a sort of absurdity to it. But I felt that this diagram actually get, was a justification for it. Especially when you consider that, in Britain at least, acid house music became very politicized very quickly because of the mobilization of young people, but also the drug culture associated with it. So very quickly it became a political problem in Britain. It, it had come just after a massive strike, a one-year strike by a coal mining union, which had like, ripped the country apart. And it was the first time since that strike that, you, that people had really moved around the country, people had gathered in great numbers. And whereas during the strike, people had moved around the country trying to picket other coal mines or coking plants and so on, three years later, young people were moving around the, were moving around the country trying to find parties and being prevented by the police from finding these parties. So the, their activities are actually very similar. So what you find is, is that in this kind of middle point here, you have this idea of civil unrest through music or through a music form. And of course, trade unions and brass bands are very closely associated with each other, so they became politicized as well. And then media hysteria at the center, really, and civil unrest. So I saw them actually as having a lot in common, both forms of folk music, both really of their time, 
one about industry and one about a post-industrial country, especially when you consider that a lot of these parties were happening in, in industrial spaces that had become post-industrial, in warehouses and factories and so on. So it was, another, it was a kind of moving on of industry, and, with, and it's kind of predicting the leisure industry in a service economy in Britain. So that is the diagram. I called it the history of the world, and it was a very kind of pretentious, overblown title, but in a way it's sort of a history of a, a lot of people who have grown up listening to that music. That's sort of, in a way, that's their, li their life, effectively. There's, mis there's spelling mistakes. It's very subjective. It was just me trying to work out something, really. And you could argue a lot about some of these things, things that are kind of t not, not in it or, or just incorrect, basically. But what happened, really what's, this is, like I said, this is ju justification for a, a project. And without that, this is, this is a rave, basically. That's what, that's what it looked like. Without that, it would just become, like I said, like a, a comedy event almost. But for me, it was very important that you had that diagram to justify it. But also, any music can be played by any other kind of instrument or group of musicians. So it had to have something special about it. It had to have some sort of meaning. So it just didn't degenerate into a sort of comedy. This is the band that I used. At, the, at that time, it was an all-male band. That was still something that was happening in the the mid nineties. It doesn't really it doesn't happen anymore. Um, very traditional from the north of England, from uh, Stockport near to Manchester. And really, what they did was, in terms of what we did with the concerts, is it sort of liberated me. Working with this band liberated me from making objects and trying to make posters or or, or things that I could possibly sell. I realized that actually working with people was, was something I loved doing, and I've really stuck with that ever since. So, I, I mean, they got a lot out of it as a band, but I probably got as much out of it, if not more. This kind of music making is incredibly traditional in Britain, and so if you go to a concert by this band, the audience would be in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. First time I saw the band play, there was, um, a woman literally in the front row doing her knitting. And I just felt, and you know, as you saw, a lot of the band members are quite young, they're students. And so when they play this music, which sounds very much like the other music they play, they do so to younger people and young audience. So it, it's, a, it's a great kind of adventure that we went on because none of us were sure if it would work. So the first performance they did of this music, they were very nervous about it because they thought it was basically what we would call piss take and people would just laugh at them, but it didn't because they're a very, very good band, and so people were just moved by the power of their music and their music, musical skills. I'm gonna show a bit, a clip in a minute, not quite yet, but um, recently I was asked to make a film about music culture in Britain, um, and to look at this anniversary, what's called the Summer of Love, which is 1988, when acid house music, this electronic music became huge in Britain and I felt that I could do a sort of traditional documentary about this moment in history but what I really wanted to do was make a film about take a step back almost like that diagram I made I virtually in a way I made a film about that diagram I made a film about British history and um, because you know, a lot of music documentaries obviously are, 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 uh, follow a very s set route and I wanted to sort of take a step back and look look at this music in a wider context and maybe look at why it happened at that time and why the why the the, the, um, the country was really ready for something coming out of a huge strike but also being under under what has been almost 10 years of conservative rule of Margaret Thatcher's rule and um, people wanting something different and so I did that, but also I, I, I realized that the structure of the film should be, should include young people now, and, sh and they should be part of the film. So I went into a school, and I gave a talk a little bit like this in a way, about how I saw that moment in history in Britain between 1984 and 1992, and I got their responses from it, from that, from that footage. They're politics students, but not many of them had done politics of the 80s, so they were quite surprised by some of the things they saw. Um, this is a still from the film. At one point, we look at the technology of that time and we talk about technology and how that
that enabled certain kinds of music making, but also democratized music making as well. Um, I'm just going to show the uh, the trailer for the film. I won't I won't show a clip. I'll just show the trailer, which is much more exciting than the film itself. Thank you. So like I said, the film, you couldn't sustain, the film's an hour long, but you couldn't sustain a film of that, that sort, of, sort of tension for an hour. So it's a, it'll just do your head in. But um, so yes, yeah, so the young people, um, a year pre, a, a few, that's about a year ago, I went to a school to give a talk because there's a thing in Britain where people, you know, who in the public eye or whatever, go into state schools and just talk to people about their lives and so on. And I'd gone to a school and I talked to a group of, young people and it, and it was the school I used in the end and I was so it was such a kind of um, for me it was quite a strangely moving experience talking to a group of young people more or less giving the talk I'm giving you now about what I've done and talking to them afterwards so I th just thought well I, if I do this film I want to go back to that school and do a talk and do a talk and see what their response is so the, in a way what when you watch the film, you're actually thinking as much about the young people as you are about the archive use and what I'm saying, about what they're thinking about it. And what's interesting is that when they talk about what they're looking at, a lot of the time they're talking about social media and how that has, in a way, regulated their behaviour. So when you saw that bit of people dancing at the end, there's, there's a lot of footage like that in, that they were looking at. And, they, and a lot of the young people were saying that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to behave like that in public or dance like that because they know people would film them or put it on social media. So they, in, a, in a sense, they're sort of policing, they said they're sort of policing themselves in terms of their behavior. Also, interestingly, it was quite a typical state school in, in, in London, at least. Um, about 90% of the young people's parents that I, uh, I work with, the parents were not born in Britain. A lot of them were refugees. It was a, it's, it's a, it's a, um, a school that's quite strict. It's not a religious school, but about 70% of the pupils are Muslim. So, in a way, it's quite a typical school for London. And at the moment in Britain, probably like here, it's interesting because a lot of what I was talking about was about the 80s and about this very kind of gloomy, dark time when the, when the right and even the far right were in ascendance in Britain. And in a sense, it's a similar situation in the UK at the moment. I don't know if you follow British politics, but it's quite a bad time. So in a sense, there's this sort of return of history and their, 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 their futures, what they've got to deal with in the next five years as young Muslim kids, a lot of them, is, is quite uncertain, especially because we're going to apparently leaving the European Union next year. So that's another thing that I'm sure a lot of people will be thinking about when they look at these young people and they hear them talk. So that's a film that hopefully we'll see we'll see the light of day it might go online it might be shown on tv and stuff in the uk at least but you will be able to see it at some point i'm not quite sure when though so going 
staying in the 80s, if I, if I may, this is a, a, a photograph taken during the miners' strike. And in a way, this is about a project that's probably totally made my career in a sense, or is the project that I'll be remembered for in a, in, a, in a way. It's my sort of stairway to heaven, if that makes sense, if any of you are into rock music. Um, this is a photograph taken during the strike. It's of a, a miner shouting or pointing to a policeman. I think the policeman is from London, which is an area that didn't have any coal mines, and police from London were shipped, were like taken up to these, these areas because they had no mercy for the miners. They had no emotional or historical connection with these areas, so they had no uh, compulsion to um, calm their behavior when it came to like the violent acts that happened during the strike. And he's obviously he's talking to one of the police from London about something that he's seen that man do. It was an incredibly divisive time in British society. I remember watching it. I mean, I, I'm from the south of England. I experienced a strike on TV. I didn't take part in anything to do with it. I was a teenager and uh, it affected me just watching it on television. And it, what really affected me was um, a, uh, a confrontation between the police and miners in 1984, where the miners were pursued up a hill and over a railway embankment by police on horseback, and also police with dogs and snatch squads in this sort of form of policing that had been perfected in Northern Ireland called colonial policing, a very sort of violent, proactive form of policing. And uh, it had stuck with me for years, and you know, maybe the almost the best thing about being an artist is being able to sort of research and find out about things that are bothering you or trying to work things out in your mind about things that have, you've seen or upset you. And this certainly had with me. And so I, I always wanted to return to this spot, literally almost, or this moment in British history and give it a, a lot of attention. So I had an idea to reenact this battle en masse, like a mass reenactment with maybe 10,000 people, because on the day there's maybe up to 15, 20,000 people took part in this battle. Um, that wasn't feasible, but what was feasible was to do it on a smaller scale with maybe 1,000 people. So the idea was to return to the site and then reenact the battle. Not in real time, unfortunately, that's something I would love to have done as well but in two parts, as a public event, basically. Now, I don't know about you, but in Britain, the reenactment societies are very big in the UK, and they do, they reenact battles from British history, from civil wars, especially civil wars are very popular. Weirdly, the second most popular reenactment society in Britain is the American Civil War Society. <laughs> the first most popular, obviously, is the English Civil War Society. So. I wanted reenactors to think about history in a slightly different way, to think about history as not ending with the Second World War, which is when basically reenactors stop reenacting. We don't reenact much uh, since then. Maybe the Korean War a little bit, but maybe. But we basically, Britain basically stops at World War II because that's when we, were, we won, basically. And so not much as of, of glory has happened since then in terms of sort of our interventions. So World War II is is where we stop as reenactors, as reenactors. But everything from Roman times to World War II is reenacted, and it's a huge thing. And I really wanted to involve those people, men, mainly men, who don't see of what they do as political to come and make a political reenactment in the place where this thing had happened, this battle had happened, but also with veterans of that that campaign, i.e., the miners. So, a lot of our recruits were men that had been part of the original strike with their children often. And then you had the reenactors. And there's a tension, obviously, between the reenactors who, on the whole, are, have quite right wing sympathies and the miners who have the opposite, you know, who are kind of socialist, basically. And that's part of the film is the build up and this distrust, especially of the reenactors to the miners. They were sort of scared of these men, even though they were outnumbered, the miners were outnumbered. The reenactors were really wary of them. That's a still, obviously. We made a film. Making the film meant we could do it. A TV company wanted to make a documentary about the event, and that paid for the event. Um, so this is, the second, this is the second part when we went through a village, which is much more accurate. Um, it was very formal. Uh, the first part you saw was a very formal part on a field. And then it all broke down after 
after that and in the village it became much more chaotic which is as it should be um, basically what I was trying to do was um, anyway, and I know a lot of the time it's sort of socially engaged art I know that's not a phrase you hear that much anymore thankfully but um, it's often about making people feel better making co communities feel better about things and feel good about each other and all that kind of stuff I actually wanted to make people feel worse after this artwork and sort of feel really depressed and upset and angry because this was a story in 2001 that had been buried a little bit by the Labour government because they didn't want to refer to the past. They wanted a sort of this nice, bright, shiny future. But if you can't, can't address the past, you can't really go forward, I believe. And so it wasn't particularly popular politically at the time to think about this or talk about this, um, this event. So in a way, I was, I was having, it was a public inquiry effectively, but a physical, performative public inquiry into what happened. And it was very important that there was an audience to witness it. Um, in a way, as I'd witnessed it as a, as a young person, as a child. And, and another thing was it was really like digging up a corpse and prodding it, giving it a proper post-mortem. And um, so we did this. It was over a period of a day. It was a public event. And uh, it was, it, I think it struck a chord with local people especially. Interestingly, the, the miners who worked on it didn't really need to be explained why it should happen. I mean, they asked, but they kind of got it. They understood why it was good to return and do this. And they actually even saw the humor in it. Even though it wasn't very funny as, a, as an event, they saw the humor within it, the ridiculousness of returning and then being paid as an extra to play yourself on the day where your union effectively was publicly humiliated by the police, by the state, not even the police. It was a, it was a state enterprise. But they got it. A lot of reenactors didn't. And even towards, even after the event, they were still claiming it was a, a it was a non-political event, which was fine. If that, if they can justify that for themselves, that's fine. Here are some reenactors. This is actually in America, I think. This is just a still I took of, off a website. I suspect this is, this is in America. Um, so in a way, this project, uh, I still can't believe it happened, and I never thought I'd do anything on this scale again. But it, weirdly, I did two years ago. Um, but it's, again, it was about this idea of not making things, but making things happen, and then just seeing what the result is. But weirdly, as a film and as an installation, this work is shown throughout the world all the time. The film's on somewhere in some museum or gallery or whatever. And I think it's because it's a, as a story, it's a universal story. It's a story that happened bef before the strike. Every country has a moment when there's this confrontation between the state and the worker. And so they all can identify with this um, moment. They all have their own version of this, effectively. This, in a way, weirdly, I'm going to talk about now what was initially a failure, um, an idea I had that was never made. I was asked to come up with an idea for the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square as an empty plinth. I think a king was meant to go there, but they couldn't raise enough money to put the sculpture on the plinth. It was by subscription because he wasn't very popular. So it was left empty and it's been empty for 200 years. And now they put contemporary art on it. And I came, I had an idea of bringing a car destroyed in Iraq. This was in about 2006 when the war was really raging or the insurgency or the civil war was raging and bringing it and plonking it this kind of disgusting object in the middle of London, in this quite an imperial space as well. Trafalgar Square has obviously has Nelson's Column, which is a which is celebrating a, a war hero, but also around it are the houses, the, these big buildings representing Canada and South Africa and Australia, and New Zealand, and nearby as well. You know these gems of the empire. So it's a hugely sort of political space. Um, and so I wanted to have this object there and wanted it to basically rot over a period of a year and just disintegrate. Um, that was a kind of an impression that someone did for me. Quite realistic, I felt, at the time. Um, and there's the plinth, obviously. Weirdly, a, a car is about the same size as a, as a, as a man on a horse. So it, it was actually perfect scale for, for this object. It, it won't surprise you to learn that it wasn't selected. It was shortlisted, but it wasn't selected. Um, 
it was a provocation more than anything else. I, a little bit like the, the reenactment of the miners' strike, I actually would, didn't think I would be chosen, but I just wanted to see, I just wanted to give the judges a hard time, basically, and see if they'd, how far they would discuss it. So it didn't happen. But weirdly, I, I'd always, I would asked to do a show in, uh, in Chicago, New York, and LA, share, they were sharing an exhibition. And I wanted to make a, a, a museum of the war in Iraq um, when the war was still going on. Because I'd seen that there's all these amazing, sort of, not necessarily art, sort of artworks or things that look like artworks that were being made at the time by soldiers, by civilians, all these things that were happening that were, I just was, felt were fascinating. But you never really got to see them in, in your own country. So again, it's like a piece of evidence coming back to see, to touch almost. So I had an idea to do this, um, to do a, a museum and then maybe tour it around America um, because it makes sense if you're going from New York to Chicago to LA or we went from New York to LA that was the first leg of this exhibition but you, you actually you take the exhibition on the road effectively we didn't really get much material from from uh, Iraq it was very difficult getting things uh, um, from the British Army especially they're, they're terrible to work with um, but uh, we got a car. A car had been been taken out. Two, three cars had been taken out of the country by a curator two years before, and he'd heard we were trying to get destroyed vehicles, well, a destroyed vehicle. And he said, "Have one of these that I've got." I mean, literally, it was as simple as this. You will not be able to get one. It took, he said it took him a year to get one out, and it was incredibly dangerous doing it, and, and quite foolish as well. He was saying because of. It, because of just being there for that time. Um, but he gave us a car, and with creative time, this organization in New York, we toured America, and we went from New York to L.A. with an uh, Iraqi citizen and an American soldier with us, and we just stopped off almost randomly at places. We were hosted, but it was semi-random, and we just hung out and spoke to the public about what was about the car, really. We were very, very low key in terms of interpretation and how we described the work, but also how we um, how we talked to the public. It was almost bland. I would say it was kind of bland the way we did it. We didn't really. Um, we tried to be as apolitical as we could, which I know is difficult when you think about what you're doing. But because we had a soldier with us, we sort of covered all the bases. This was in 2009. Obama had just been elected and had just been sworn in as president and the country at that point I don't know if you remember was actually things were actually okay I don't think you could do anything like this now but then it was all right I mean we were very worried I mean we, we were the soldier and a guy who had worked in Iraq as a translator whose life had been in danger many times and they were both nervous about going on the road taking this to the south and we went through a lot of what I would imagine are Republican areas in the south in Tennessee Texas, um, Arizona, all through the South basically, and just stopped off and showed people the car and had discussions with them. Um, and it was kind of amazing because so many people had stories. A lot of people wanted to know about the car, uh, what kind of car it was and so on, but then often the conversations would go all in all these different directions. You'd, people talk about religion, talk about their own families. Uh, for example, this woman here, this is in Arizona, she just walked up and said, oh, I used to work in the green zone. She told us her story. She was the person that would get basketball stars and hip-hop artists to come and talk to, and sort of do signings with the troops. They do pedicures and manicures for the troops, all these kinds of things. And she told all these stories about the green zone. You know, she claimed there was a, a big prostitution scene there with the women who were cleaners and so on. So we got all these amazing stories from people. Um, and I think it's probably because we didn't, we were criticised actually, the most, criti you know, we, the most criticism we got were, for, were from anti-war people, when they saw how we were presenting it, they were really horrified that we weren't being anti-war enough about it, and we were just being really low-key, and I think that's because I didn't really want to alienate everybody, or anyone really, from, from the discussion, if you can, actually I'm going to go back, I'm just going to, this is Isam, the Iraqi here, he was basically self-educated in Iraq because he wasn't allowed to go to university. 
and he um, spoke many languages. He'd read the Bible, read the Quran. He was incredibly well-read and well-versed in poetry and politics and history. And so for a lot of uh, Americans, he was the first Iraqi they'd ever met. And you could see they just couldn't, when they started talking, they just couldn't believe that someone who could quote the Bible back at them and things like that. And, and so he was an amazing person to travel with. And the soldier we went with was a was was still serving, sort of still on in reserve. I think was a psyops operative. So he had always kind of strange ways of communicating with the public as well. But um, so that was quite interesting because we never really kind of got to the, really got to know him that well. But, and that's probably because of his training. So that was you know maybe he's probably doing psyops on us in a way. So we're just keeping an eye on us. So I'm just going to show the film in just a sec. I'm just going to introduce it. So we, like I said, it was very low key, but we did interviews with the public as we um, went around America. Um, and as you can see, it's uh, quite uh, lo-fi the way we work. But again, I think if you don't, if you go into somewhere with loads of cameras and whatnot and lights and that, it just intimidates people. So it was, we kept it very, very. Um, Cheap, I think is the word, as you'll see. But this is one interaction we had with a man in uh, Memphis. Um, and he tells just a story, which is really about this time and about, especially about sort of the first, you know, post 9-11 America. So I, w I wouldn't say that every interaction was that, like that, as intense as that, but we had a lot that were. Um, and again, for me, what, what was interesting is, that in a sense, it's very similar to a lot of the conversations. You know, he, he talked about, you know, obviously he talked about music, he talked about contemporary politics, his family, and then talked about the car. It's almost the, sort of the perfect conversation, in a sense. But um, 
that's what we found. And in a way, it made me very encouraged for the country. I was actually very, very optimistic about the country at this point, um, the way people were talking. Because I'd, I'd lived in America and through the year just after 9-11. I was, and so I'd seen kind of how bad things could get, as I felt, and during the war in Iraq. And then you, you come back and you see that and you talk to people and no one was mean to us, no one shouted at us or anything. People were actually just interested. And like I said, maybe that was like a special moment in American history. Of course, a lot of people saw the car from the road. Probably more people saw it when it was traveling through than they did uh, when it was stationary. Um, which is, in a way, it's a, a very American in its own way. And in a sense, we just went some places for one day and then we'd leave and we'd be another place the next day. So you'd be almost like a memory of something happening. Um, a very, it's almost like taking a relic, like a medieval procession, taking relics to different villages and towns. That's how it felt almost, that's what we were doing. We were taking, again, like this piece of evidence, this relic of something. This is the car now. Uh, it's in the Imperial War Museum in London. Um, in the main atrium. So it's, uh, in a way, it's in a place where it will be kept. Um, and it's, uh, and it's uh, kept, it's, it's a museum about 20th century warfare and 21st century warfare. Weirdly, you don't have a, as far as I know, you don't have a war museum in America. You should definitely think about that. Um, it'd be full of things. And so um, this, uh, so it's there. And it's next to a tank, and then a V V two rocket is above it, and you know it's it's in a con it's in a very specific context. And now it's an exhibit. It's not a, not an artwork. It never was an artwork. It was just part of a artist project. Um, the problem was when 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 we put this into museums, people just looked at it as if it was an artwork. So in a way, the museums or the art art museums, I should say, were not the best contexts for this object to be in because people automatically think of it as being art. And so, you know, you have strange discussions about the color of it and, you know, the, the beauty of it and so on, which is, you know, absolutely the wrong thing. Um, well, a bit of levity now, literally. <laughs> I think we need it, don't we? Um, I was asked to come up with an idea for a festival in Glasgow in 2012, and I... I've always thought, what's the most stupid artwork anyone could ever make in the history of art? How can I make something that look, makes Banksy look good and, um, <laughs> and interesting? And I thought, okay, I know what. I'm going to make an inflatable scale model of Stonehenge and then tour it around Britain in a, in a, in a way that, you know, Stonehenge on tour in this kind of crazy sort of uh, thing uh, and just see what happens, basically. That was the idea. And about two months later, this happened. It was a very quick process. It's hand-painted in Britain and made by a company that made you know, bespoke uh, inflatables. And uh, so and they didn't bat an eyelid when I said what I wanted to do. But um, for me, it was about, it, it was during the Olympics as well. And the Olympics shared the costs. And I just thought, Olympics is just full of so much sort of pretentiousness about um, countries and uh, everyone gets so nationalistic and uh, wrapped up in the sort of the weirdness of sport and uh, but I thought let's do something that was kind of like took the piss out of ourselves and just showed that we could laugh about ourselves and our history and enjoy our history in a way and be very sort of tactile with it at the moment you can't go into Stonehenge you can just see it from like 30 to 100 feet so when you visit Stonehenge, you don't get a sense of the scale, but also you can't touch it, you can't go within it. And so you just have to admire it from a distance. And it's, it's, a, it's quite a, potentially quite a disappointing visit if you've traveled all day to see it. Um, so I just thought, well, let's, let's take it on the road. And you know, for some people, they won't realize when they wake up in the morning, they take their dog for a walk, but the Stonehenge will be in their park. You know? So I like the idea of the surprise but also, I like the idea for young, for kids to to interact with archaeology and to like. That was definitely not allowed. <laughs> this kid, it was it was a it was just a way for, for to get kids interested and to some almost brainwash them into enjoying 
this sort of thing. And maybe five years later, they go and see Stonehenge or they have a memory of it and they just think, well, I, I want to know more about that place. What was that all about? And so on. So it was a, it was a, it was a pro-archaeology thing. I was worried about Druids. You know, Druids are these people that do these ceremonies there. But the Druids really loved it as well. They had a sense of humor about it. So in a way, it was, it was about, it was all, for me, it was all win. It was, I could, you couldn't, it was the, almost the perfect thing because it made people so happy that it was almost t too overwhelming in, in a way. So, but it was, it's toured the world as well. It's been all over the world. And um, I can tell you in, in 10 days or two weeks, it's actually going to Stonehenge. It's gonna, it won't be put next to Stonehenge because that would mean multiple car crashes as people drive past Stonehenge seeing two of them. <laughs> One of them kind of moving in the sort of wind as well. But it will be at the site of Stonehenge, uh, away from it to avoid confusion. So um, it was called Sacrilege because I thought I might as well put the criticism in the title so I don't, so I can just say someone says it's sacrilege and I can say, well, it is. That's <laughs> correct. This is in London. I learned very quickly that if you don't, as an artist, if you don't get something interesting happening when it opens to the public, the press will want a picture of you jumping on it. So I, what I did was I just got a lot of uh, gymnast groups to come and go on it. And so they did these amazing displays on it. And this is one, this is one in London. And what you get is, well, you get these incredible photographs, if you're lucky, of, of these young people just almost suspended in midair, like they're levitating. And in a sense, these are the photographs that are maybe about the more, obviously the more serious or spiritual side of Stonehenge, because obviously Stonehenge is an incredible structure. And it is a, an act, it's, it's the biggest act of national projection we have in Britain, in that no one knows what it was really for. We know that there are two points of the year where the sun goes through the stone, so it's like a clock. But we don't really know what happened, how people, we don't even know what language people spoke. There's no written word from 5,000 years ago. And so the theories are just constant. And Stonehenge is in the news almost as much as the Second World War in Britain. There's always something happening, there's a discovery, and, and all our kind of dreams and anxieties of a nation are, are sort of piled upon this, this, this mute structure, basically. And so for me, it was, it's great because no one knows what it was for. And, and, and I think that's good because no one should know. And, and in a way, no one should really know what being British is either, what our national identity should be as mysterious as Stonehenge. No one should be able to define our identity or what it is to be British. Because as soon as you start doing that, that's when you're in big trouble, I think. So it can be, it can be all things to all people. And hence, it always, it's kind of a mirror to our society. It, it really is in Britain. And so that's the serious side of it. But really, it, it was a joy-giving artwork, frankly. There was the odd tear from children who kind of banged their knees and hit their heads, but really it was massively outweighed by all the happiness. So um, I didn't really worry too much about the odd hospital visit that happened. Um, anyway, back to war. Uh, I just realized that this is kind of strangely paced talk. Uh, um, I, had a, I was asked to come up with an idea of how to commemorate the Battle of the Somme, which was the battle that uh, the worst it's basically it's the how do you it's the worst military disaster in British history in, in one day 19,000 men were killed in a day in France and uh, it was going to be commit they wanted it to be commemorated commemorated there's these series of artworks around the First World War and I was asked to come up with some idea and I just thought to myself, well, what, I know what it can't be. It can't be an inert object or a group of objects, each symbolizing a dead man. It can't be that because that's what people expect. And that's the pilgrimage model of an artwork, basically, where you go to a place, you look at all these objects, you're kind of overawed by it, and then you leave, and then that's it. I mean, that's the kind of traditional way, the ritual, really, of remembering the dead often in Britain is the big inert object. So I had an idea, which was basically, it was a very simple idea, I mean, a really simple idea, but really difficult to do, was to have people it, basically on that day, from early morning onwards, just appear around Britain, men dressed as soldiers, 
just appear around Britain in all these very incongruous places, in these very 21st century places, just look a bit lost, but with some kind of purpose, and just travel through the landscape. So instead of uh, you going to the memorial, the memorial went to you, whether you wanted it or not. It intervened in your life. These men would walk through a shopping center or be outside a school or go through car parks, just basically congregate where the public are, which is shopping centers, public squares, motorways, just walk along motorways. So you get seen, railway stations, we started in railway stations. I can't quite remember what, what order the images are in. So, And then just hang out basically and be p present. Not be like ghosts or zombies, just be there, hang around the public. Uh, you wouldn't talk to the public, yeah, they were mute, but they were definitely present and human. They were these figures basically. The day started at railway stations. This is in Manchester. Um, eye contact was quite important. I do pity this guy though, in black. <laughs> he got, I, you know, he was like, like being eyeballed by like 30 soldiers. And, um, but so what, because I always knew, even though it's a very human project, it's about bodies basically, moving through landscapes, through cities, it was a social media thing as well. Because I knew that if you, if you, had these men, there's 1,400 around Britain at railway stations in the morning and tube stations. They'd be seen by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people already within the first 30 minutes. And those people would take photographs, they'd post stuff, it would be. So you would start this campaign basically and the public would document it and the public would basically, um, would, would, be, would do your work for you effectively in terms of getting it out there. So the railway stations were really important. Um, yeah, this is Manchester. You know, another hellscape of a contemporary hellscape. And they walked through shops. They'd have to, they, because as soon as you, even though you didn't get permission, we didn't get permission for any, any spaces apart from railway stations because there's sort of security implications. But they would, I told them just go, just start walking through shops and shopping centers. And uh, because even if they're going to tell you to leave, you're sort of leaving as soon as you arrive, basically. And really, no one's going to tell 30 soldiers to leave somewhere, security guard. So they just did that. So they went through, you know, our equivalent of the trenches now is kind of an IKEA. And um, also, these really kind of ugly parts of Britain, which there are many of. They would go to these very contemporary places, places that, like I said, didn't exist in 1916, but also would would have been inconceivable to anyone from 1916. So I definitely wanted that sort of disjunction, visual disjunction um, of, of men being in these, these places. The way we did it was basically we recruited people um, through theatres and drama groups and so on, but also just through word of mouth, but we couldn't tell them what we were doing. This whole thing was a secret kept by about 1,600 people. No one could uh, talk about it because it had to be a massive surprise, I felt. There'd be no point doing something if the public were, were expecting to see this in, on, a, on a morning. It would have taken all the, the uh, surprise and emotion out of it as well. So, you know, you, you did not know this was going to be happening. And that I felt was important because in a way a, a, an attack is a surprise as well. They, but they hoped on the day of the Somme that it was a surprise they were going to attack, but actually it wasn't. But um, people managed to keep the secret. It's, and it also, it's, it's counterintuitive because a project like this cost a lot of money. It cost, I don't know how much it exactly cost, but it would have been over $2 million to do it. It's one day, and uh, usually you, you just pump pre-publicity into something like this to make people aware it's going to happen. But I, I said nothing. You can't have anything. So we trained over a period of uh, two two months. Um, we sort of team building exercises, and then acting exercises. So there's a, it, it was it was quite intense for the participants. We also did a lot of um, role playing. We thought that maybe the men dressed as soldiers would be abused by the public, the public would be angry about them. 
We had people in Northern Ireland dressed as soldiers walking through the streets of Northern Ireland. That hadn't happened for uh, since soldiers, since the British Army had left Northern Ireland in the early 90s, so or mid 90s. So there was tension around Northern Ireland, but even just having soldiers on the streets of Britain, but you don't see that much in this country, in, in, in Britain, sorry. It's, which is a legacy of, of uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland because soldiers were, were targets even in mainland Britain. So we did all this role playing and we were quite worried about it because we just didn't know what to expect. But in the end, what happened was that people, you know, role playing, oh, what if a drunk comes up to you? What happened was people were totally into it in a way I, just, I wasn't expecting. I'm a bit of a pessimist about these things. I trust the public, but I'm still a pessimist. And um, I think the reason was that the week before, Britain had voted to leave the EU, or some of Britain had voted, I should say. Half of Britain had voted, or a little bit more. And I think the public were actually really sickened by the behaviour of politicians leading up to this and afterwards. You know, a, a, an MP had been murdered in the street, assassinated effectively by a member of the far-right group just a week before that. So it was actually a really fractious, unpleasant time. And the week after, there were like leadership contests and it was chaos. Basically, no one was in charge of the country and the public was sick of this. And I think that what the public instinctively understood was that these were men or representatives of men who had sacrificed their life for their country, maybe in a foolhardy way when we think about it, but they'd done that. Whereas we had this very unpleasant spectacle of politicians who were basically sacrificing their country for their careers uh, to be prime minister or whatever to advance themselves so it, it was quite poignant in that respect and that's something I was not expecting um, like I said the soldiers didn't speak they had cards which is basically a miniature gravestone which said their name the regiment um, their age and the fact they died that day a hundred years previously and they gave that to the public that's what that's one being given there to these guys in Birmingham and um, in a way answered most questions of people they again the pu public sort of instinctively understood what was going on and uh, didn't really ask many more questions and even if they did they wouldn't have got an answer they might have got a, like a recognition or a nod but the the participants didn't speak which actually would made it quite tiring for them not to be able to explain themselves occasionally. But like I said, what we didn't prepare them for were people crying in front of them, which is what happened and something I wasn't, I certainly wasn't expecting. I might just talk about this and then, how am I doing for time? Actually, I've got my watch here, so I know. Okay, I'll talk about this and then we'll, we'll take questions, I think. This is a project I just did, I did in the same year, isn't it? In, 2016, I had, a, I had an idea a long time ago to, uh, to do a life class with Iggy Pop. And uh, in 2016, I wrote him and said, would you be interested in being, being naked uh, in front of a class of, of a group of people, a group of Americans, and they will draw you and they will sort of investigate your body with, by drawing you because of course drawing can show things that photographs can't, it can bring out things that a photograph just cannot do that. You know, drawing has this incredible power to articulate the body. And, um, and he, said, he said no, but he was interested. He was interested and then I approached him 10 years later and he, almost immediately he said, yes, I'll do this. And then I asked him, why did you say no? And he said, I wasn't old enough to do it. I was, you know, he was basically 60 when I asked him and then he was more or less 70 when we did it. And he wanted to do it at a certain age, um, at a certain point in his life and a certain point in his career as well. Um, let me just, there he is, posing. Uh, I thought I should show you that, but the slides are in a bit of a weird order. Um, so that's the class, just to prove I did it before I sort of go and talk about him. So, of course, his body is absolutely as important as a guitar or a drum or a bass guitar or whatever in terms of rock music, understanding rock music. This body has been through so much. It's witnessed so much. It's been on public display continuously for 50 years. I don't think any man has subjected his body 
to such punishment, but also to scrutiny from the public. You've seen it age. You've seen him try to, for it not to age, but then, but it has, you know, he's not immortal, unfortunately. So for me, that was interesting, just seeing this body change through time. Also, when he's moving, it's different from when he's sitting down or when he's being, uh, when he's stationary. So that was something as well that I thought was interesting to look at him still. Because, you know, if you've, if you've ever seen him perform, he's not still ever. So this is an unusual thing for him to sort of lose control of uh, his environment, which I think was something he was worried about uh, when I approached him the first time. Um, so I was thinking about him, I was thinking about art history, about Greek sculpture, about these heroic images um, that I feel that he represents in terms of the culture of rock music and how important he is within that culture. Um, so this is the class, going back to that image, this is the class. Um, we had him for four, four or five hours and we did, I'm sure a lot of you do live drawing, we had a lot of short poses. I thought let's get some short poses quickly because what if he gets annoyed with this and he runs off, at least I'll have some short, I'll have some sketches from the short poses because I just couldn't believe he was going to sit in this room and be subjected to this for more or less half a day. Um, this is the long pose as it happens. Um, so we had short poses, lying down, standing up and so on for like five, ten minutes. And then we had like a, a two hour long pose of which this is it. And I wanted something that uh, was sort of heroic, sort of holding a staff or a spear, something quite simple. And the students, this is one of the, this is the drawing from from that from the long pose. It's quite weird when he he takes your clothes off in front of you. I have to say, I was quite I uh, didn't really know what to say for some seconds, but um, he was very at ease with that. So the students were from, what I wanted to really have was like a cross-section of America, look at him. Different ethnicities, different, obviously, people at different ages was really important. So when we told, we had a meeting before and I told the group, oh, by the way, you're being paid to draw someone, but this is the person you're drawing. It's 21 people in the group, a third went bananas because they knew who he was. A third were kind of interested and a third had no idea who Iggy Pop was. So that was quite interesting. It's the people, the very young people and the very, and the older people had no idea who he was, but there was a section of people who were just beside themselves with this. Um, so, and also I wanted people who had different levels of experience of drawing. So, so you have images like that, a very kind of very crafted image of him that's done by someone who might have been drawing for like 20 years. And then you have this, which for me was mine and his actually favorite drawings were by a young woman who'd, this was her second class she'd been to, but I just loved these, the line she had, but also the kind of intensity of these drawings. It reminded me of like German expressionist uh, paintings or drawings. And I think that's what he liked about them as well. Also, he has one leg longer than the other and he has a very, finds it very difficult to stand for any period of time and so he has this very strange gait to him where he sort of his body is sort of contorted and she really found that she really got that with her drawings and um, she understood it and whereas some people some of the the artists the participants might have wanted to idolize him slightly idealize him she didn't at all she first because she didn't know who he was and secondly, but she just she just drew what she saw basically. She didn't try and make him look nicer in a way. And so this for me is probably my favourite work. This is oh, let's go back. This is the class. That's him in the middle, obviously <laughs> enjoying <laughs> that. Um, he was. Yeah, he was great as well, as you can imagine. He really, he didn't disappoint in any sense of the word. And he was totally into it. And I think he's one of these people, when they get behind something, they will just do it and they'll try and do it as properly as possible. So like I said, this is the class. 
more, you know, again, like this cross-section of America, looking at Americans. Originally, I'd offered this project to the Smithsonian, into the National Portrait Gallery, because I just thought that would be the perfect venue, really, for it to kind of enter the collection, this sort of national collection, and be uh, go into the heart of American culture, and, you know, heart of the American power as well. Um, but they didn't want it. Uh, so I, uh, the Brooklyn Museum took it very quickly because the director there totally understood why this would be a great thing for them, really. And all the drawings were given immediately or accessioned immediately to the museum. So none of the drawings are on the market, none of them uh, are at art fairs or made into prints or whatever. They were all kept, even like little sketches done by the participants in the margins of bits of paper were taken. So we just kept everything. It really is a record of him. So, you know, in 50 years time, if anyone's still on this planet and people want to know about Iggy Pop, they'll look at photographs and he's one of the most photographed people in the world, but also they might um, look at these drawings and try and get an idea of him from the drawings as well. Because like I said, drawings can tell you things that photographs can only hope to tell you. That's one of the short poses. So it's, uh, that's like a 10 minute one for him. The other thing about him is that really he's lived his life in such a way that it's really almost in parallel with a lot of performance art from the early 70s. I don't know, even know if he was that aware of it at the time you know, he, he is actually incredibly cultured and knowledgeable about art and, and literature and film and so on, but I don't know if he was in sort of 1972. But a lot of the things he was doing in terms of his behavior and his uh, ideas about breaking the fourth wall or going or putting your body through extreme experiences, to me is very more or less the same as what Vito Conchi was doing or Chris Burden. You know, I think there's a very, he's so close to that. So close, and he's sort of lived his life as a performance, as like a performance artist, effectively, and still does. Um, that was the that lady was, yeah, she had no idea who it was, but he was very, he was very, very charming with her, and very nice to her. So we showed the work uh, by each participant, each artist, and it was important to to not do like a rock and roll sh show. I didn't want a rock and roll show. I wanted something that was just actually very calm in a sense. And like you'd see at the Mets or in the British Museum, the way the prints and drawings are, are framed and um, matted. I, I didn't want it to, to look crazy at all. Um, interestingly, one of the younger artists, you can just see the work there. He was doing these um, caricatures of Iggy Pop, really funny caricatures of him and his body putting faces in his body and doing all these very, very funny things. Um, and he was learning 3D uh, games design, I think, video games design and so on. So he was bringing that to it as well, which I loved. Um, so yes, it was, it was done in a very traditional way. Um, and also with a collection of the Brooklyn Museum, I have an incredible collection, like, like this museum, of world cultures you know, from 10,000 BC, to now and so I incorporated into that show a little selection of images of the male nude um, because I just felt it, might, it was good to give him a context and I knew that he'd like it as well basically because he's into I knew he was into this kind of thing so you had these tiny sculptures from uh, this is a satyr playing a harp with his quite large uh, I don't know what the technical term is cock basically and um and he and i also felt that you know in a way he is a satyr you know they, they make music they run through the forests they drink they find women all those things that's basically how he's how they'd lived their lives some of these people so it's also my bridge all these other these sort of incredible images of the male nude or the male body that i felt was quite important to to show him in that context and then the self-portrait by Egon Schiele. Um, I can stop now, if you want, and we can take questions. Should we do that? Um, I won't talk about some other things, but thank you.
So any questions? Where is it? All right. Okay. Um, thank you. I the intersections of um, humor, satire, and critique in your work, and also if you see yourself as a trickster and how you rally people behind kind of these jokes that or these ideas, do you do you take a serious stance or is it? you present to institutions some of these projects that could be taken as jokes? Well, I mean, humor is a great sort of way to attract people or seduce them in a, in a sense, isn't it? And uh, I don't mind if things are funny. I don't mind that. I mean, you can find humor in so many different things. So that's just my personality, really. I, I've probably quite got dark sense of humor but i think it's good to keep keep things approachable and just be and in terms of the way you, i sort of communicate with my participants you basically i think you should never sort of surprise them with things they should know exactly what what you're doing and why but humor is just a great human element i mean it's humor human it's just a, and i think a lot of contemporary art is very funny i mean Warhol had an amazing sense of humor. Joseph Boyce had an amazing sense of humor. Surrealists. There's a ton of humor in modern and contemporary art that maybe we forget about sometimes. And it's like a lot of those things were people enjoying themselves, making things. Picasso. I'm not comparing myself with any of those artists, obviously, but what I'm saying is when you think of artists, there's a ton of humor in their work and little jokes and all sorts. And I think it's just a good way to get to uh, it's, it's a sort of fast track yourself into someone's mind is by using a joke and you have a reaction and you're in, you're there, basically. Oh, yeah. All right, uh, this should be a quick one, okay. but I'm just curious what your favorite Acid House track is. Uh, well, that's a good question. There's a, a track of a groove that won't stop by Kevin Saunderson, which is really great. And uh, for, there's a lot, and uh, so yes, I think that might be one. And that's one of that's one of the tracks the, br the brass band I, I work with performed, and it's an amazing structurally. But what's interesting about a lot of those songs is that, and about electronic music is it was so easy. Well, it was easy. Some people felt it was easy at the time to dismiss it because it a it was not real music, not real musicians, all of that. But as soon as you transpose it for a brass band, you realize how amazing, how musical those songs are and how sophisticated they are. I mean, I knew that anyway, because I liked the music. But it's quite shocking, I think, for some people to hear these incredible songs and realize they were made in someone's bedroom and in a way. But also the drug culture didn't help, in a sense. It made things easier to, d to dismiss. But actually, they were, they were great pieces of music in any sense of the word. Thanks for the talk. Um, it's kind of a Brexit question. All oh, right, great. Sorry. Um, in a kind of, kind of roundabout way, I'm remembering probably being around the same age as you, um, the minor strike, and years later seeing Battle of Orgreave reenactments. Yeah. And thinking about that image that I had in the 80s of the working class communities under the cosh of the Thatcher government and so on and so on. And then fast forwarding now to where we see northern working class communities being seen as responsible for Brexit in some way. And maybe in by extension what's happening in this country as well. I suppose I'm just wondering on reflection what your sense or understanding of those communities is now. Well, unfortunately, the highest sort of anti-EU vote or pro-Brexit vote were in those areas often, in the f former industrial areas, where people who had once been socialists basically had become absolutely sort of, their p politics had turned, and I think they, they were abandoned by the state and uh, 
just left to rot effectively those city, those towns were. I mean, I've been to quite a lot of those towns and they're just incredibly sad places. So I think that that did happen. There is truth in that, unfortunately. Um, and it's a long story. I mean, it's we have, you know, you have Fox News, we have The Sun, which is a newspaper, which basically does the same job. And for years and years was anti-Europe, but also anti-immigrant and would have endless stories, not most of them not true, about immigrants taking money from the state, taking people's jobs, conning people, being criminals. This is 30 years of, of this, and it has an effect. If that's the only thing that people are reading and they hear these stories and, and other newspapers, but you know, Murdoch did a very good job, really. The, the, the EU, this, this sort of, the campaign to leave the EU started about 40 years ago. It didn't start like six months before the, the referendum. It had been going on for a long, long time. So, um, yes, those areas are, are suffering massively still, and, and they will suffer more. I was at a colliery town the other day, because I'm doing something there, and uh, the biggest employer in that area is a car company, is Toyota, no, Nissan. And the car industry is going to be, as you probably know, is going to be just decimated by, by Brexit. So they're going to get it again, basically, unfortunately. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering how, after you lived with your parents and were unemployed, how you decided that you wanted to become an artist, um, and what made you think that you could succeed at doing that? That's good. Too. That's two good, very good questions. I mean, basically, I couldn't do anything else. Literally, I tried to work in a gallery uh, as a technician. Literally, and this is no lie, on the first day, in the first morning, I burnt a David Hockney print <laughs> and then hid it from the gallery owner. And then, he, and then I think he sold it without realizing it had a huge burn, well, it did have a huge burn mark on it. And he sold it like that. But, uh, so that was literally the first morning. And, and then I tried to work in a museum before that as a sort of someone who, like admin or whatever it is, and that, I couldn't do that. But I knew I liked art, I liked being around art, I liked museums, I liked the culture of art. And uh, luckily, the you know, contemporary art world is a very accepting place or, uh, in, in, of, of all sorts of people, I feel. And so I just had to sort of get on with it, really, and see what I could do. Also, I, and I have to admit, I went to a private, I was privately educated, and I think those schools, I didn't really learn anything there, but I think I probably learned to be self-confident. That's the only thing I did learn. I didn't learn it, I can't remember anything that I was taught of anything, and I hated it, but I think I learned that. I don't know how they teach that in a way, but they did. So I just always felt I'd be okay, even though I wasn't entirely sure what that meant. And, um, but it was not great, and it could have gone easily gone wrong. Uh, so I was, I'm lucky to be able to do this and sort of get away with it in a sense. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I did not go to private school, but <laughs> I learned confidence in America. Um, <laughs> um, I have a question about, I'm really interested in your comments about success the success of the final project sometimes is less than what you might have wanted. For instance, the um, post Thatcher uh, music project film, and the when you said um, when you exhibited the car in in museum spaces, it wasn't as wasn't spectacular, perhaps. Um, so I'm kind of interested in where for you. I mean, obviously the project brings different kinds of outcomes and I'm interested in where where you measure success well success maybe not is the, not the right word but where where projects um, succeed <laughs> where projects uh, fulfill think, your kind of I mean I've, I could have talked about loads of things tonight that I don't particularly like that I've done or I just didn't feel were that exciting for me personally but uh, I think it's um, often like with Iggy Pop and with the, with the um, 
soldiers, as I would call it. It did have a title, but I, I don't like using the title uh, for some reason. Uh, they, I think uh, when you have an idea initially, when I do, it's more or less fully formed, and the, the skill is just trying to protect it from people trying to chip away at the idea and trying to change it, and, oh, what if we did this? Can we do this? It's like, no, no, just let me do what I, that idea I had, because it's, it's an okay idea, believe me, just trust me. So it's basically success is, is, is making the original thought you have uh, as, as, as much accurate to the thought you had in your mind. Um, so, for example, with the soldiers, which is, which is actually called We're Here Because We're Here, which is actually a song that was sung by the soldiers that just went, we're here because we're here because we're here because we're here, because, you know. Um, I had the idea, and it was more or less exactly as I hoped. I had one thing that we weren't able to do was for people to sleep overnight on the streets of London and then wake up almost as homeless people and start the day like five in the morning. We didn't do that. Because I just didn't want to push it. I couldn't believe we were allowed, I'm being allowed to do it anyway. And then it was just too complicated in terms of safeguarding and so on because a lot of people were quite young who took part. But um, it's just trying to be faithful to the idea you have in your mind, the ridiculous idea you have in your mind. Um, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I guess my question is kind of going off from the previous question. Like I realized that lots of your work like finally landed in the museum space, uh, like aka like very quite conventional um, exhibition space. But actually, the process of that outcome is rather, you know, socially engaged and then um, push the boundary of exhibition. So my question is like, what does that mean to you as your work is being collected finally? Um, to the museum space as like, do you think that is like a destination of your piece? Some of it. I mean, museums are very good for showing art, aren't they? I mean, they are kind of made for that. So, you know, they're, they're constructed for that purpose. And so you can use all the power of a museum and all the kind of ideas within a museum and people's expectations to do something. So, I mean, I have done, I have curated exhibitions that are for museums and, and, and I love doing work in them. But sometimes it just doesn't, just doesn't work if you do, if you try and shove something in a museum. I think it's better now. Britain has gone, I think, if anything, Britain is a bit ahead of, of the US in terms of how they treat the public and how, the, because museums in the UK are free still, thank God. You know, that's a good thing. And so people have a f sense of ownership of their museums. They really feel that it's part of, I think, they feel it's part of the culture and that, that they can take part in it in a sense and, and it's for them. So you can walk into almost all the national museums in Britain and you don't have to pay anything. In, in America, it's different. The board is so important. The rich people are so important. They sort of, I wouldn't say they dictate what happens, but I think you always, when you go, when I go and work in America, I always have to meet the board members, have to have dinner with the board members, have to you know, do a tour with the board members. It's like endless people. And, um, and so you have, they, those people have to be pleased in a sense, they're the pr primary audience. And so that makes working in American museums a bit more complicated sometimes because th those people are always on the minds of, the f of people or they tend to be. You can contradict me here, anyone who works in a museum, but that's what I feel. And it's different in Britain, it's a bit more egalitarian. It really is, I believe. And people love art in Britain. They love contemporary art. It's a sort of a success story for Britain. So, um, if, and there aren't many. Uh, so it's a quite, it's 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 quite good to to work in in the UK, especially. Hey, we have a double question. I'm going to start with my friend. I have cheating. Okay. Jeremy, thanks for your uh, work, first Thank of all, you. and thanks for being here to talk about it. Um, can you talk about, and, and in detail, about what? Um, can you talk about how you managed to transport the bomb dot car to, uh, you know, I saw it at the new museum. Can yeah. you just pour over the customs, negotiations? Well, I didn't. Okay, I, that's very briefly, I didn't have to do any of that because it had already been brought to America by another curator, Robert Cuvier, his name is, who'd used it 
in an event in Texas, I think, uh, like a poetry reading. And uh, like I said, he heard we were trying to f get to uh, Iraq to get a car that had been destroyed. I mean, it's a really stupid, reckless thing to do. And he said, "Don't." And, he, like, and I said, "Like he said, he's, uh, like I said, he, he said, don't do it. Take this car." Uh, so we didn't have to deal with any of that. But it took a year for him to get a car out of the country. Uh, God knows how he did it, and if he had to pay people, or he had to go through charities and the Red Cross and so on. It sounded pretty horrendous. He wrote me a long email about how he did it recently, about a year ago actually. So, so there's none. I didn't have to do with any of that. Do with any of that. What was the second question? Well, first to thanks. Thank uh, you. And then maybe this is a segue because your talk made me think about scale. Yeah. So not the scale of an object, but the scale of making things happen. Mm. You know, from two million sixteen hundred to a small group of 14 and a really intimate encounter, but with a very famous person. Mm. And I'm wondering if you might share, especially thinking of a lot of people who might be in this room, when you began to push beyond a scale that you might have thought possible. So as a young, you know, kind yes. of coming into art and making that. things, yeah. if you look backwards and then look forwards, if you can share with us the scale that you're thinking about now in current projects. Okay, well, like I said, the tr transformational transformational moment was working with the band with the brass band that was the the moment when I realized that actually the public you can work with the public they're actually really easy to work with they're up for stuff like in Britain especially maybe because of this museum culture I don't know but I was talking about they're interested as long as you treat them with with a level of respect and you know, you tell them what's going to be happening and you're honest with them, you can get a lot out, tons out of, of the public, as I would call them. And, and they will go along with things if they like you. And so you just do that. And that was that was a, an amazing moment. I don't know if that's right about scale necessarily, but that was that project with the brass band was a tiny budget. It was like three thousand dollars because you can rent, literally rent a, br a brass band for next to nothing. The economy of brass bands is very strange. So you can really do something quite big in a sense, a big big idea for not much money. And so that was good. But, but I think working with the public, I always have faith in the public to do the right thing if you work with them as an artist. Um, so that was, I mean, I don't, on the whole, I don't like being around people a lot. You know, I find, I, I, so working with the public for me is a way of sort of getting around that sort of annoyance with the, with human beings. Um, but um, so that's a scale thing. But also if you make a poster and put it in the street, you know, thousands of people can see it. Much, much more people than would see it if it was in a gallery. So I was always aware of not wanting necessarily to address a museum audience, even though museum audiences are big in Britain, they're never going to be as big as everyone in the street. So that's important. Um, I don't know if that's answered your question, but I mean, at the moment I'm working on a number of projects. I'm doing a project at Stonehenge soon and I'm doing another a clothing thing and whatnot, you know. But I mean, scale now, just it doesn't really, it's, it's infinite, isn't it, with the internet? It can be everywhere in the world very easily. So it, in a sense, it might be easier for artists now than it was 30 years ago when you had to go through the press to do things and all of that. We're out of time. The pleasure. Thank you.